Hey everybody, thank you for thank you for your interest. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, as Kiva said, the the subject of my presentation is uh, the practical application of multi-use sustainable forest management at Halliburton Forest. I'm quite quite proud of of what my colleagues and I do here um, to achieve multi-use sustainable forest management, and I'm I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to start with you. So, in jumping right into it, um, when I when I'm asked to to describe Halliburton Forest or to explain it to somebody. I, I generally say the same thing, and that's that we're a sustainable multi-use private land stewardship company, which which Kiva actually uh, used as well to describe to describe the business. Uh, I always say also that each of these words deserves a lengthy discussion or a presentation in its own right, but today, uh, in any case, we're going to focus on the the multi-use part of the phrase. And and my goal is to explain how Halliburton Forest over the years has managed to balance. A variety of uses on its properties in a in a manner that I would actually suggest is fairly unique, um, at least insofar as it's it's to such a great extent. Um, in that we have businesses that are ranging from logging and sawmilling to dog sledding and overnight camping, all on the same land base. And I'm going to emphasize throughout my presentation that we see these uses as complementary to each other and really um, foundational to the to the business model that we run. In terms of an overview of the land base itself, at least for those of you that haven't haven't been out here um, to Halliburton, uh, we own and manage approximately 100,000 acres of, of predominantly hardwood forest here in Halliburton County. We're located on the southwestern corner of Algonquin Park, and we share an extensive boundary uh, with the park. We're about three hours or so north of Toronto and about three hours west of Ottawa. Uh, the picture that I've, I've put up on the slide should give you a good sense of what type of land we're managing here in Halliburton in that there's a lot of lakes, uh, there's a lot of hills, and there's a lot of trees. It's mostly hardwood, which you can see from the uh, the color distribution. Um, tends to be maple dominated, but there's a lot of softwood too mixed in, especially uh, white pine in certain areas and then hemlock, uh, especially around shorelines and on ridges. And as I previously mentioned, we, we manage a diverse business on this land um, yet, for the most part, our property is undeveloped and, and in quite a natural state, although it is a, a managed um, natural state. So, I, I always find it interesting to take a look at a satellite image of, of the property, or in any case, part of the property, because it, it does give the impression that um, Halliburton Forest is a great big piece of pure wilderness. Uh, the image that I've got up here is just the northern half of our property. Uh, and that, that tends to be where most of the multi-use um, businesses and, and activities occur. Uh, when you look at this image, it looks like a great big green blob. There's not really a whole lot going on. It looks like it's all you know, perfectly intact uh, forests without any human impacts. And a lot of people, especially um, folks that perhaps aren't, aren't as familiar with forestry, would say that that to them is the definition of sustainable, a you know, big green blob with relatively little activity. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that that's, that's what a multi-use forest is. And, and that point comes clear if we add the road and trail layer on top of that same image. And, and when I add that layer, the many different uses on our property um, become obvious. Uh, there's about 400 kilometers of roads and trails shown on this, this map of approximately 50 to 60,000 acres. And these roads and trails provide access to our resources, uh, whether that's lakes, uh, rivers, gravel, sand, and other aggregate, and, and of course the trees and timber themselves, but also some of the recreational infrastructure like campsites and other features that I'll, I'll tell you about later. Just for context on this image, the, the yellow lines are the major roads. Those tend to be the haul roads that we uh, would use for logging traffic, but also for passenger vehicle traffic, whereas the red, blue, <laughs> excuse me, and purple um, lines are, are trails or secondary roads that are, are more often for uh, non-mechanized access purposes. Um, so as I said, we use these trails for, for pretty much everything that we do, and this infrastructure is shared uh, by all of our operations from, from forestry uh, to tourism to conservation to research. So having given you a bit of an overview of the land base, I'll, I'll give you the, the high level overview of the business itself, and then we'll dive a bit deeper 
um, into some of the, the different businesses that we're operating within this multi-use um, enterprise. So the, the interesting thing that, that I'd, I'd mentioned, and this is, this is something that makes Halliburton Force today a little bit different from how it was perhaps a decade ago or two decades ago, and it's that we increasingly operate as two different divisions um, that work on the same land base, but that complement each other. So, so in the middle, we have Halliburton Forest itself. And then on the one side, we have the Tourism and Recreation Division. And on the other side, we have the Forest Products Division. And beneath each of these divisions, there's a variety of businesses, and then there's a variety of operations. And what I've, what I've provided on this is really just a snapshot of it. I'm probably missing uh, about a third of the businesses or operations that we're engaged in. Um, but each, each of the two divisions, the Tourism and Recreation Division, and the forest products division has its own general manager. Um, each has its own management team, and each has its own um, business planning. And I'll get into some some details of that later. In total, uh, between these two divisions, we employ about 100 people um, full time year round, as well as another 30 full time contractors, and then uh, a handful of seasonal staff or part time staff that that help out in various ways. Uh, interestingly, that level of employment is almost perfectly split down the middle between the two divisions. Uh, there's about 50 on the tourism side and 50 on the forest product side. And it means that we are the largest private employer um, in our neck of the woods in central Ontario. So, so now that I've, I've given you that, that high level overview of the business and we've talked a little bit about the land, I'm gonna dive into each of the two divisions of the company and probably revealing my own biases, I'm going to uh, start off by talking about the forest products division. So um, I, I won't go into a lot of detail on, on the information that's on this slide, but I did want to share it. And it's the, it's the work ethic that we embrace uh, within our forest products business. And it's the key principles um, that we try to work to every day in order of priority uh, from, from being first and foremost safe, and by being safe, we're able to be clean and tidy, efficient, ambitious, and that, that in the end will allow us to be competitive. The reason why I, I, I put it up here is because I'm going to put up the equivalent that we have for the tourism and recreation division later, and I, I think it makes for an interesting contrast um, and, and reveals to an extent the, uh, the, the complementary but also slightly different um, uh, cultures that exist within, within Halliburton Forest. In any case, we'll talk about that more later. So getting into the forest, we'll talk about the trees first. Um, picture I provided here is a fairly typical hardwood stand uh, here at Halliburton Forest. It's sugar maple dominated, obviously, uh, perhaps a little bit more so than the average stand, but you can see a little bit of yellow birch in there. Stand like this, like much of Halliburton Forest, has probably been cut about four times in the last hundred years. Uh, the last two cuts, generally speaking, in the late 90s and late 70s would have been um, somewhat scientific and sustainable. Certainly the one in the late 90s would have been the one in the 70s, you never know. Uh, but the two prior cuts, uh, which would have been, let's say for the sake of discussion in the 50s and in the early 1900s, um, would have been straight up high grading. And, and that's pretty typical of this entire region. So, so over the course of the last 100 years, you, know, you had two harvests that really degraded uh, and to an extent depleted the, the, the forest in a stand like this, and then you've had two thinnings that probably improved it a little, or at least didn't do too much damage. In, in the case of this picture here, uh, which, uh, which, which, which I would say is generally representative of Halliburton Forest, it is probably a little bit on the overmature side, um, but in any case, this particular stand was, was deemed ready for a thinning. And so having given you an overview of what the forest looks like before, what our typical uh, harvest area looks like after we go in and thin it out. And this photo is taken in the exact same stand, maybe standing 10 meters away. Um, so typically when we go in and manage uh, forest within our property, we remove about a third of the basal area. We practice what's often called single tree selection, although in our property, we have a different name for it, which is financial maturity selection. And I'd be happy to give a whole presentation on that another day if I'm invited back uh, to your seminar series. Um, generally speaking, we prioritize the removal of, of diseased as well as mature trees, and in doing so, we release the young, high-quality, vigorous trees that have great potential for value growth or that meet other objectives, which I'll talk about in a moment. And this is the normal method for us, and in a, in a stand like this, uh, with that thinning having been done, we would expect to return uh, for a follow-up thinning 
in approximately 20 years or so. <clears throat> in terms of our forest management processes within the forest products division, uh, we follow the normal protocols for Ontario. So that generally means that before any trees get cut, a forester such as myself or my colleagues uh, spends a period of time in the bush to get to know it. We'll do a pre-harvest inventory. Uh, we'll refer back to the previous inventories and we'll, we'll write a prescription. Um, once the prescription is done, we'll go in and do the tree marking. This is a very normal thing uh, for us in the hardwoods of central Ontario, although I know in different parts of Canada, it, it, it's less common or more common. Um, basically, the tree marker goes in and applies different colors of paint. Uh, typically, orange or red paint means that a tree is to be cut, whereas blue paint uh, typically means that that tree is special and ought to be protected. We prioritize the harvest of the worst trees first, as I mentioned, um, but we'll also protect critical wildlife trees that provide mast or uh, cavities, whether nesting or feeding cavities. Uh, we try to maintain or enhance species diversity in the stand through our tree marking regime um, and, and generally try to upgrade the stand, whether it's in terms of its, its ecological value or its future economic value. Um, one thing I'll mention that, that's interesting in the context of tree marking and forest management planning, and that fits in with the theme of this presentation being multi-use, is that we're, we're quite unusual at Halliburton Forest for not really ever um, implementing aesthetic buffers within our property. Uh, we tend to tree mark and therefore to manage our forest right to the side of a road or a trail. Um, we don't leave a buffer to hide what we're doing. We think that's important, um, not so much because we're loud, proud foresters and we want to show off what we do, but because uh, it's productive forest area that ought to be managed. And in, uh, in, in going right up to the road or to the trail uh, pre presents an educational opportunity for the many other users of our property. Um, with that said, we of course do leave environmental buffers where, where appropriate. It's just the aesthetic ones that we tend to abstain um, from in implementing. And this is widely accepted by our, by our tourism staff and our clients um, when our foresters do that, which, which I find is quite unique because many other multi-use operations try to, try to hide uh, the active forest management. So once the tree marking is done and the harvest has been planned, our logging crews get started. Uh, we have about 20 loggers, another 10 full-time contractors working inside this property. And then we have the same amount again, plus a few working on crown land, supplying our other wood processing facilities. Within the property of Halliburton Forest itself, uh, we harvest approximately 90,000 tons a year of mostly hardwood timber, which amounts to about 100,000 trees, if you want to count it that way. Um, most of our logging is done by professional loggers using chainsaws and cable skidders. Uh, we're still very much focused on that method. We are moving towards mechanical harvesting, but we still like the we still like the chainsaw and cable skidder method. We find it's the highest quality with the lowest impact on the forest. And I am going to acknowledge that the image that I have provided here is not a great example of safety. And uh, and uh, and I'm going to assume and believe that our our GQ model logger here. Um, would normally be wearing his high vis and, and eye protection, but that he wanted to look cute, so he took it off. I spoke about cable skitters, and that is the primary method for removing um, timber from the bush here. Uh, we find it's very important due to the hilly nature and, and complex um, hydrology of our forest. Um, and, and with the cable, the amount of trail coverage is able to be reduced um, to, a, to an adequate level. Sometimes we'll use excavators or other equipment to prepare trails for the skidders beforehand, or sometimes we'll go in and rehabilitate trails after. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One may just be environmental, but the other is because many of the trails that we use as skid trails end up being used for other tourism purposes later um, in time, and, and particularly between harvests. Um, and those other purposes could be dog sledding or hiking, and I'll, I'll speak about that later on. The trees have been skidded out of the forest. They get cut up into logs. Uh, this particular machine is a slasher forwarder and it cuts up, let's say, about 500 trees a day. Uh, we typically now use more conventional truck mounted slashers, but this particular crew uh, likes, their, likes their slasher for. It's a handy piece of equipment too, especially using them in, in areas that are commonly used by tourists because it reduces the amount of landing space that's needed as they're able to travel up and down the road quite easily with that machine. Uh, we emphasize the importance of product recovery to all of our operators, and we require that they make good decisions to maximize the value as well as the volume that we recover from every tree. 
um, because waste is not acceptable. Many of our trees have been growing for over 100 years and they deserve to be utilized to their fullest extent. Once the trees are cut up and delivered to our sawmill or one of our sawmills, uh, we evaluate them. And so we'll scale them and measure them and make sure that they're to spec. Um, it's an ongoing uh, process that, that we see as one of continuous improvement and education with our logging contractors because we want to ensure that the most value is recovered from every harvested tree. Um, in the case here, uh, we took a picture of it because the logger screwed up and he cut a couple of uh, couple of beech logs um, too small, too short, and uh, they were no longer the adequate length needed to cut a railway tie, which is the highest value product that we get out of beech. Um, the logger got in trouble for that mistake and we probably docked his pay, <laughs> but he probably didn't make the mistake again. I will, I will take a moment actually just to highlight, I often take for granted the fact that we have big beech um, here in Ontario. I imagine most of you that are listening, if you're in uh, Nova Scotia, you may not see a lot of beech trees this big too often. So that's that's kind of cool. Unfortunately, we now have beech park disease too. So um, beech like this won't be around for much longer, which is, a, which is a heartbreaking reality, but it is what it is. Um, apart from the saw logs, we do a lot of math to determine how to make the most money from each log. Um, that's because we operate on the theory that we run our sawmills to make money, not to make lumber. Um, obviously, we do make lumber at them too, but if we're able to sell a log to somebody else for a higher margin than we could process it ourselves, we will sell it to that somebody else every time. Um, for example, uh, in the image shown here, these logs are going to be sold as veneer. They would have been sorted out of the saw logs, and uh, we have a we have an incentive program for our logging crews to ensure that they are rewarded. Um, for properly slashing and identifying potential veneer, which is why these all have different colors painted on them, because that identifies which crew they came from. Once the logs arrive at the sawmill, they're processed into different products. Uh, we now operate two different sawmills, which are fairly similar in terms of size. Each one is uh, processing about 400 logs a day or about 20,000 board feet. So they'd be considered mid-sized for central Ontario, or maybe small by most American standards. Um, but they're not really all that big and they're not really that small either. Each mill employs about 20 people, including administrative staff um, that, that keeps them operating. Our sawmills emphasize safety, efficiency and performance. Uh, we like to invest in our people as well as our equipment um, to keep the sawmills running well. Uh, I'm quite proud of the fact that during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, despite some challenges with, uh, with hardwood lumber markets, we've kept running consistently through. And uh, we've actually taken the opportunity to, to focus on training staff and on, uh, and on replacing some of our equipment, which means that we're going to come out of this downturn a far more efficient um, and more productive operation than, than we went into it, which is something that I think our entire team can be quite proud of. As the lumber is produced at the sawmill, it gets sorted into different grades and sizes, and some products are used in industrial applications like railway ties and truck flooring. Other products are used in appearance applications like home flooring and furniture. Um, our wood is used far and wide, although most of it stays in North America. We do do some export um, overseas. And we're always trying to maximize the lumber value through staff training, upgrade stations, and, uh, and relentless sorting of products to, to find the highest margin um, home for every product that we make. To that, to that point, um, in order to capture some additional value from our wood, we also produce some specialty products. And a good example of that is our paddle shop, which uses uh, lumber from our sawmill. It's often the specialty lumber. We manufacture a couple of thousand uh, canoeing and kayak paddles every year, um, usually quite high quality ones. And, and what's nice about this is it allows us to create some more jobs locally, but also to capture the additional value um, from some of the wood that we produce. And this image shows our master paddle maker, Ray, or I should say our former master paddle maker, Ray, who recently retired, uh, uh, making, a, making a, a laminate paddle um, for, for a customer. And that, that can turn, in this case, it's a, it's a good case study, it can turn about a dollar's worth of hardwood lumber into about $100 worth of paddle. Um, obviously, there's a lot of labor cost in it. That's not $99 a margin, but it is, it is, a, it is a business and it, it's a nice way to add value to wood. <clears throat> about the paddle shop just before I move on from that one is it, it, it it's a great tie-in from the forest products division to the tourism and recreation division and in fact recently we uh, we moved the paddle shop over from being a component of the forest products division to actually being part of the tourism and recreation division because it was such a good time for it. The last part of our vision before 
uh, we move on to the tourism and recreation division is uh, is the research institute. And we have a wide range of research activities at any time. Uh, the institute's an internal entity uh, that we use to coordinate uh, research activities, curate data, and share results. We frequently partner with research institutions like the University of Toronto and, and many others, and sometimes we fund their research as well. And we find that that, that feeds us valuable data uh, to, to fulfill our, our desire for continuous improvement, but it also feeds us really good people um, because we're able to hire great people right out of the research stream um, at these institutions. And the two individuals shown in this photo are, are Masters of Forest Conservation students and at the time, and both of them uh, in one case still works with us as our chief forester and in the other case worked with us for a long time and, and then eventually moved on to another opportunity. So that's, that's, the, that's the overview of our forest products division. And there's one other kind of point that I wanna make about it, which is that um, we, we don't put walls up around it. As I said earlier, we don't leave buffers along roads. We don't leave buffers along trails. So that's the, that's the physical example of what I mean. But the, the, the less physical example is that we frequently want, run tours um, with students and members of the public. And we're very open about, uh, about sharing what we do both in the forest and at the, the manufacturing facilities. Um, both because we think that's important for earning our social license, but also because it, it allows us to, uh, to learn from the public and to, to, to be asked tough questions sometimes that we need to be asked. The last, last point, which is the bridge uh, between the Forest Products Division and the Tourism and Recreation Division is FSC certification. So we were the first company in Canada uh, to be certified as sustainable by the Forest Stewardship Council, and we're quite proud of that fact, and we continue to be certified today. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, when you are FSC certified, you are audited on a regular basis and the auditor tends to come in and ask a wide variety of questions of a wide variety of people within your operation to make sure that you're achieving uh, social, economic and environmental sustainability. In this particular case, the auditor who's wearing the hard hat is, is, uh, is a questioning one of our loggers um, privately having asked us to, to step away. Um, so that they can get the straight scoop on if we're treating him well, if we're paying him well, if we're uh, making sure he works safely and, and things like that. What's interesting about FSC is, in our case is that um, we actually enjoy very few benefits within the forest products division from being FSC certified. People are often surprised to hear this uh, and think that, you know, as a forestry company, we must get better money for our lumber or, you know, preferential um, purchase orders for our logs, and the answer is that we do not. Um, the the benefits that we get from FSC are actually almost entirely on the tourism and recreation side of the company, in that many of our clients and guests uh, are attracted to us because of our reputation for sustainability, um, or they're impressed when they get here uh, by hearing, you know, after say going on a hike and through a recently logged area and asking what happened in this area. And then it being explained to them by one of our tourism staff what had happened silviculturally and also that we're certified as sustainable by the Forest Stewardship Council. So that bridge brings me to the next part of my presentation, which is uh, an overview of the tourism and recreation division. So whereas the, whereas the forest products division has the work ethic that I showed you earlier, the tourism and recreation division has what we call the shared values. And there's similar points in terms of priority. You can see they both start with safety, but they're tweaked um, to better serve each operation. And I won't go into a lot of detail now, but or any detail really, but I would encourage you when, when if you if you go back through this presentation to put the put the work ethic and the shared values next to each other and compare them. And it's a it's a good indicator of the different cultures that exist within a multi-use um, forest and and that you've got very different types of people working together on the same land and that's encapsulated in these in these key key principles that we that we work with them. So the core the core purpose of our tourism and recreation division, if you ask me, is that it's to it's to share our property with others and generate revenue from the same land base that is primarily used and operated on by our forest products division. So I said if you ask me, because that that thoroughly reveals my bias as a forester. If you were to ask my colleague who actually runs the tourism and recreation division, uh, she would say, that's crazy. The purpose of the tourism and recreation division is to own and manage Halliburton Forest and the forest products division is there to generate a little bit of extra revenue on the side, right? So it's kind of flip-flop depending on who you're asking. But I'm the one giving the presentation and so my, my, my point stands. Um, 
in any case, uh, the, the image here shows what's probably our most popular activity during the winter season, and that's dog sledding. Uh, we have a, a kennel with about 130 Huskies in it that has a year-round staff of about three plus an extra three to five seasonal staff for offering dog sledding tours to clients. And dog sledding uh, allows people to visit our property to enjoy its amazing features. And interestingly, um, the vast majority of our dog sledding trails are actually old skid trails, some of which go through stands that were harvested as recently as six months ago. Um, so that's, that's a, a great use of infrastructure created by logging operations, but for a tourism purpose. A similar example to that is snowmobiling. Halliburton Forest is the largest private snowmobiling operation in the world. Uh, we have six full-time grooming operators throughout the winter and approximately 400 kilometers of trails that are groomed to a high standard for, for snowmobiling. We limit the number of day passes that we allow into the property to approximately 100 per day, uh, which really maximizes the, the quality of the experience for all of our guests and clients. Um, and what's, what's fascinating is that all of these trails that are used by snowmobilers within our property are, are the same roads and trails that we use for, for logging operations. Um, so that, in, in a sense, conceptually anyway, doubles the amount of revenue that we're able to generate per kilometer of road that we build. Um, now, obviously, this means that during the snowmobiling season, which tends to run from December through March, we need to be quite careful and strategic with the location of our logging operations. And so there's often, <coughs> excuse me, that, I don't have COVID, I promise, or in any case, you won't catch it through a WebEx. Um, in any, uh, what I was saying is that that often leads to a, a rather tense negotiation um, between our, our, our tourism bosses and our forestry bosses every fall or, or the preceding year as to where we're going to be logging during a given winter um, because you can't have that conflict. But in the end, uh, they, they always figure it out and we're able to, to maintain these, these very different property uses using the same infrastructure and essentially the same property. Uh, switching gears. Uh, we offer a range of activities. I won't go through all the examples. I'll, I'll just speak of one here, and that's the canopy tour, which is the longest of its kind in the world. Uh, we typically run three tours a day, every day from spring to fall, and it's, it's typically sold out. Um, this particular activity is in an old growth white pine stand in the property, which we would never harvest anyway. And so it's a nice way to take what, what is not technically productive forest area from a timber point of view and use it for, for forest management purposes. Um, and what's an interesting example here is that we actually just rebuilt a good portion of this uh, of this uh, this tourism infrastructure, and it was a nice connector uh, between the forest products division and the tourism division um, because some of our forestry staff who have an arborist background were were thrilled to to be involved um, by climbing the trees uh, alongside our tourism staff who have arborist backgrounds. Um, and then also the lumber that was used uh, to, to rebuild a portion of the canopy tour was obviously milled at our own sawmill. So it was a nice little kind of uh, spiritual connection between the two divisions of the company. During the, oops, during the summer, we also uh, have about one special event per month, or sorry, during the year, we have one per month and then more in the summer. Uh, these can range from big trail races to concerts. Uh, including a, a hundred mile race and including a concert series that's held on a floating dock uh, with a lakeside amphitheater. Um, these events are typically more done on a break even basis than on a than on a on a for profit basis. They're more because we love doing them than we're trying to try to make cash off of them, but but they do carry themselves. Um, we use them to bring people to the property as well, which is obviously good for the overall business. What's interesting with these special events is that um, they often require us to, to be a little bit careful with the forest management operations in that, um, obviously, uh, during a concert series like this, it wouldn't be ideal for a log truck to, uh, to come barreling down the road um, with its, its jake brake going and, and interrupting the, the performance. So it takes a little bit of balancing and negotiating between the different sides of the company. But as I said before, they're always able to, to figure it out and find that balance. Hunting and fishing tends to be a, an area of, of common ground within our company. Um, both sides of the company love it, so there's rarely any disagreement. <clears throat> um, the way that we run this part of our business is the hunters pay us a certain amount per acre per year um, for exclusive hunting privileges over a given zone of our property. And uh, we, we monitor their activities to ensure that they're, they're following the law and, and being good stewards of the land. Um, what's rather unique about Halliburton Forest is that during the hunting season, we kick out everybody else on the property and give uh, those hunters truly exclusive use of their hunt zone. 
Um, with the, the little exception of maybe we'll allow some logging operations to continue, but typically all of our loggers disappear during hunting season anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, in addition to hunting, fishing is a big activity for us, and, and we, run a, we run an operation called the Fishing Society, wherein stakeholders such as the gentleman in this photo, um, who's a leasee with us, uh, is able to, to, to make a contribution to the Fishing Society, and then Halliburton Forest matches that contribution, and every dollar that goes into that pot ends up being spent on fish, which makes everybody happy because it means the fishing is good. So, so hunting and fishing is definitely a common ground. Um, within within our company. Uh, we're also well known for our efforts to educate the public about wolves. Um, in addition to wild packs on the property, we have a captive wolf pack, uh, which has a wolf center kind of built around their enclosure. So it's a 15 acre enclosure in which a number of wolves live. And in this, in, in this uh, exhibit um, or wolf center, uh, one can observe them through an observation area and then also, also look at a variety of exhibits that, that talk about the history of wolves and the ecology of wolves um, in central Ontario. We, we view this part of our operation as, as, a, as a social sustainability um, effort. It's not, a, it's not a major cash generator, nor is it intended to be. What we generate at the Wolf Centre uh, is used to, to carry the facility forward and to reinvest in it to make it more educational in the future. But we do, we do view that as a, as a positive thing from a social point of view and then also People that come and visit the Wolf Center tend to also participate in the other activities that we offer throughout the year. So <clears throat> looking at these wolves eating beavers uh, intestines leads me to talk about our restaurant, which we operate at our base camp right next to the Wolf Center. Um, the, the restaurant that we, we run um, is basically a casual, uh, high quality forest diner that, that focuses on well executed comfort foods. Um, an interesting anecdote, the reason I even brought it up, is, is there's an interesting parallel to draw between the forest products division and specifically the sawmills and the restaurant, um, in that the, the two businesses are very much alike, and you would never really know that if you didn't work at a company that had both a restaurant and a sawmill operating on the same land base. And, and the similarities between them are that, you know, first and foremost, the restaurant business and the sawmill business are brutal, tough, competitive knife fights um, of businesses, they're very difficult, but they're but they're very rewarding too. Um, both have relatively high per unit raw material costs that you have to continuously work to grind down without sacrificing quality, right? So the the sawmill wants to get higher quality logs but at a lower price, and you're constantly trying to optimize the length and the diameter and the the heart size and and the species and whatever without uh, without paying too much for it or or getting lower quality product. And the same is true of a restaurant where you need great ingredients at the right price to make good food and keep people happy. And then, and then the, the last point, the last similarity between these two businesses that I find so interesting is that both are so dependent on good quality control systems. Um, you know, you have a sawmill and you're accidentally cutting thin lumber, your customer is going to reject your product and probably will not submit a subsequent PO. If you have a restaurant and you undercooked fish, you're probably not going to get that person back um, to, to eat there again. So it's an interesting alliance that kind of emerges within Halliburton Forest between the restaurant and, and the sawmill. And, you can kind of see it in the mutual respect that the manager of the restaurant and the manager of the sawmill share for each other. And I just wanted to share that anecdote. As I, as I start to wrap up um, my presentation, I want to um, speak to the fact that um, in addition to all the very exciting activities and, and you know, very engaging stuff that we, we have here, there's also a whole lot of quiet um, and relaxing stuff too. A major business for us are long-term leases. And, uh, and these long-term leases tend to be guys like this that send it, sit at the end of the dock and, and want nothing more than peace and quiet. This is probably the biggest alignment that we have um, and, and also the biggest challenge that we have between the Tourism and Recreation Division and the, the Forest Products Division in that these folks, uh, these leases tend to be very long-term. Many of them have been at Halliburton Forest for 30 years or more. And so they understand and appreciate the nature of forest management. They've seen an area get logged and then, and then completely uh, grow back to its prior state and then get logged again. Um, and therefore they're they're very understanding of the nature of forest management. But at the same time, um, you know, they're here to to chill out and enjoy the peace and quiet. And they can sometimes get a bit irritated when they hear a whine of a chainsaw going on for four or five months in the summer. And we have to try to remind them like, yeah, you're hearing, you know, this chainsaw every day all day this summer, but you haven't heard it for 19 years and you're not going to hear it for another 20. And we have to kind of work with them in that respect. Um, but in any case, the other the other thing I wanted to mention here is that it's this peace and quiet 
um, that that really brings together most of the staff within our company, whether they're on the forestry side, whether they're a logging contractor, or whether they are a, a tourism tourism professional. In closing, um, I want to finish on our map. I see it's pretty pixelated up there, but but you can download it if you wish to see it in more detail. And and what I want to close on is the different perspectives that that exist um, within a multi-use forest operation like Halliburton Forest. As a forester, when I look at this map, um, I see road access, um, and I see road access that allows us to do forest management and logging um, and, and related silvicultural activities and also research. But I know that if I were to go next door in my office here and talk to my, my colleague who runs the tourism division, um, she would say that she doesn't see it that way at all. She sees recreational trails um, and roads to to take people to campsites and fishing spots and swimming spots. And if I were to go and talk to uh, my colleagues at the sawmill right now, they would probably say that they see um, good roads that trucks can go fast on that allow us to get timber to the mill quickly and therefore cheaply. So different perspectives, obviously, but but they're all more or less correct. And the, the challenge and the opportunity that we find as a company is trying to find a way to strike a balance and make them complement each other. It's, it's rather challenging, but it's also, it's also uh, very rewarding and, and has resulted in a fairly resilient um, enterprise that we run here that, that we've proven over the last six months um, can actually endure a, a, a globe, a world changing um, uh, challenge like COVID-19 fairly well, relatively speaking, uh, because it's so diversified and has all these different people with different interests working together. So. That's that's pretty much my presentation. Um, I hope that wasn't just the me promoting what we do here the entire time. I, I tried my best to draw some draw some connections between uh, what we do uh, on one side of the company and the other, and how they can complement each other but also conflict. But I'm hoping that during um, this question period, uh, we get some questions that that maybe put me in the hot seat and, and force me to speak a bit more to the details there. So thanks very much for your interest, and I'll pass it back now to. Uh, Eva. Hello. Oh, um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's so interesting to see what Halliburton Forest does and be nice to see something like that happen here. Um, a sustainable forestry business that has a lot of different facets to it. Um, so we do have a couple questions. So I'm going to Let's list out the first one. So can you roughly break down your annual harvest by product? Um, this product um, this product Oh, just one second, sorry. All right. Do you want to try talking again? See if Yep. Okay, yeah, you're good. Uh, All right. Product. Product presumably referring to um, timber, like 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 round wood, like like saw logs, veneer, uh, pulp wood, and firewood. Um, I think so. Yes, yeah. um, and also like species as well, kind of. Yeah. Okay. So in, I'll start off with species. In terms of species, we'd be about sixty to seventy percent hard maple, um, right off the bat. That is by far the dominant species that we have here. Then you'd probably have another twenty percent beech. That's a bit more inflated than what the actual beach composition is in the forest, but that's because right now we're conducting uh, a lot of salvage harvests in anticipation of, well, not anticipation, we're living it in because of beach bark disease. Um, and then yellow birch would be the next common hardwood at, let's say, uh, 10%. And then the remainder would be a total mishmash of, uh, of, of red oak, cherry, basswood, ash, uh, hemlock, not really any white pine, a little bit of spruce mixed in, and then some weird stuff like ironwood, things like that. A little bit of red spruce actually too, but that, but that's that's a good breakdown. It's six, sixty percent hard maple, twenty beech, and ten birch, and then you've got mishmash the rest. In terms of product group, uh, we're a little bit peculiar. So our, our saw log recovery, um, which includes veneer, um, tends to be around sixty percent. Um, that and then and then the balance I'll speak about in a moment. When you tell people 60% saw log recovery, they're often very intrigued, especially if they're from the East Coast. Frankly, I find it's much lower out there. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is that there's a long history of, uh, of relatively conservative um, forest management here, and we're continuing with that today. And so we enjoy the benefits of that. 
Um, the other is that our sawmill is literally two kilometers away from the forest gate. And so our transport costs are very low and we're paying stumpage to ourselves, which means that we tend to dip a little bit lower into the quality spectrum of the saw logs. If we were selling our saw logs to another facility, probably the bottom 10% or 15% of our logs would not be considered saw logs. But it's because we're integrated, we're able to maximize that value recovery. So 60% saw logs and veneer. Uh, the remaining 40% would be a mix of pulpwood and firewood. We're not in a good location for pulpwood, unfortunately. Um, I wish we were. Um, and so the vast majority of that remaining 40% tends to be used for uh, firewood, like domestic firewood. And it's quite a hot firewood market because there are a lot of cottages up here and a lot of seasonal residents and as well as a lot of year-round residents that depend on firewood because we're not on a natural gas line. Awesome, thank you. Um, so second question is, how much of the land base is in a mature age class? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It, it depends on what on what you consider um, what you consider to be mature, and and you know that you, you may have noted earlier when I was speaking about our silvicultural system, I, I said single tree selection, but we call it financial maturity selection. Um, we're very uh, how do I say we're very open minded um, when it comes to silviculture, and and you know our believers that there's no real rule set in stone. There's some key principles, but but the nature of your harvesting regime and your return interval is really as much determined by markets as it is by, um, I should say, is determined by markets with a perspective on the very long term um, as it is by uh, by what's written in a silvicultural guideline. So, so generally speaking, um, you know, if, if I had to take a stab at what today with today's markets could we go out and uh, and viably um, uh, have a logging operation in and feel good about it from a silvicultural point of view. Probably, probably 20% to 30% of our property, so 20 to 30,000 acres on this particular chunk of land. Um, but, but that could change tomorrow, depending on depending on what happens with uh, with markets. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, another question: Are there any new business developments that Halliburton Forest is working on that you haven't mentioned? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot actually. We're we're uh, we're always we're always working on something. It's it's quite exciting. So there's there's some growth opportunities within our forest products division that we're very excited about. Um, can't can't speak to them in great detail, but but one example that I'll give you is uh, our biochar project. We've been at it now for ten years, and I often say that um, you know we've been at it for ten years, but that's because we were ten years too early in getting into it. Um, we should have waited until somebody else had figured out the technology and then started that business. But in any case, we are where we are, and it's been a very educational experience. So we have a biochar processing facility um, where we, we take currently raw char, raw biochar derived from wood and uh, process it into a, a, a material that can be used to displace carbon black, which is a petroleum product on a pound per pound basis. Um, and we also have the ability to, to produce char ourselves using the sawdust from our sawmills, um, although that currently is kind of a secondary process. So that's an example from the forest products division. On the tourism and recreation division, we have a very exciting um, uh, uh, de business development opportunity that that uh, I haven't spoken about, and this is the one I can't give too many details on because it's it's going to be announced in October. But uh, it relates to to integrating further uh, within the tourism industry and and allowing us to provide more support to to people who want to come to Central Ontario but don't want to spend their entire time at Halliburton Forest, so that we're in a position to offer a much wider wider range of experiences to them. So those are those are two examples, but. Yeah, there's there's a fair bit going on here. I mean, our, our website has a has a good overview of the many different businesses. Sometimes it makes my own head spin, but that's why that's why I have good colleagues to help keep it all straight. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so I think that's it for questions. Uh, thanks again for coming in and speaking. It's really interesting, um, and hopefully, like I said, Nova Scotia can try something out like that. <laughs> we can develop more of these things. Um, so this is our last webinar. Thanks everyone for joining um, this summer. That's about it. Actually, I don't have my usual talk about new webinars. Uh, if I could if I could say one closing comment, Kiva, if you don't mind, just to your point about um, hoping or wishing to at some point uh, uh, has something similar, and and I mean, you may very well. I, I don't I don't know enough about Nova Scotia, but um, 
it, that, that's a that's a good a good opportunity for me to just give credit where credit is due um with respect to Halliburton Forest. So like th this company uh has existed since the early 1960s. Um but the the Halliburton the 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 core of what Halliburton Forest is today was created um by a fellow named Dr. Peter Schleifenbaum who who's quite a visionary and and somehow some way came up with this idea of uh of really doubling down on the multi-use aspect of what we do and uh and and living it um for many years and getting through that very difficult period of uh of being a lifestyle to the point that now we can be a professional operation not to say that it wasn't professional before but but it's uh it's a different business now and so if anybody in nova scotia is thinking of trying to accomplish the same thing um it's uh it it, it takes a it takes a lot um i think to get something like this started uh, and then once it's started, uh, it's probably a lot easier to keep it going. And so I guess that's a, that's a way of me saying that there's, there's a lot of people I didn't talk about during this presentation that deserve credit for what's been built here. Uh, my colleagues and I have, have, have kept it running and, and I'd like to think made it better, um, but, uh, but building it's a challenge. With that said, if anybody out in your neck of the woods um, has any big ambitions of, of achieving something along these lines, um, they, they're more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, and, and my colleagues and I will share whatever knowledge we can. And that's why I provided that email address at the bottom of uh, the presentation so that folks can contact us if they have any questions or ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely an uphill battle. Um, but yeah, that's great. Thanks so much. And I'll send out that um, email as well in the thank you email in case anyone wants to email Hobart and Forrest. Uh, but yeah, thanks again. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Have a lovely rest of your day. And that, that's about it. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye.